there's only so much dirt, there's not making any more of it, but don't buy just because of it. Welcome income hackers. This is your host, Ryan G. Wright. This podcast is for individuals and families who are interested in fast tracking their financial success. You'll hear experts discussing topics like generating a residual cash flow, building wealth through real estate, financial literacy, creating a family legacy, and overcoming your fears. If you get value out of this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. It's a big help to me. So who are turnkey rentals? When I buy a turnkey rental, I'm working with an operator, those types of things. Who are the players involved with like a a turnkey? Um, If I was wanting to invest in turnkey, how does all that work? Yeah, so you got to, I mean, you and I both know this, but, you know, for your audience to understand, you, you got two, generally speaking, two types of investors. You have a passive real estate investor and you have an active real estate investor. So if you're the type of guy that likes to watch HGTV at night and watch all the, you know, the property fixing and flipping shows, you're probably an active real estate investor, meaning that you like to roll your sleeves up and you like to swing a hammer or you like to manage a crew. So you like to find an ugly or distressed property, fix it up or improve it and create value and flip it for a chunk of cash. That is typically what an active real estate investor is, or they might be a wholesaler or somebody who's just truly actively involved. Now let's look at the other side of that uh, spectrum. Someone who's a passive real estate investor is saying, hey, I'm a busy guy, I've got income, I've got credit, I've got some savings, I need to invest and create cash flow for myself, but I don't wanna be actively involved, I don't want brain damage, and I don't want to take on a lot of risk. So I want to just build a portfolio of real estate, and uh, stack them one, two, three at a time, however fast I can do it, and create a passive income for myself every month and every year. That's a passive investor. And it doesn't matter whether you're buying single family homes, fourplexes, or you're participating in apartment syndications, you're essentially building your portfolio. So to your question about turnkey, it really fits within the passive camp because a turnkey rental means that it's like new, there's no deferred maintenance, it's cash flow positive from day one, it's professionally managed, it's in a good market, it's in a good neighborhood. It's really everything that you want in a real estate investment, and I'm not saying everything goes 100% perfect all the time, that just doesn't happen in the real world, but that's about as close as you can get to it. Yeah, I like it, and so with the, if you're, if you're hiring somebody to, or buying, I should say, turnkey rentals, somebody has gone and found the property, Um, and they've already found a decent deal, and then the work's been done to that property, is it typically anything that's that's five years or older gets replaced? Is that kind of how the typical thing, or what does that look like for as far as the work? Yeah, so a turnkey operator would be a guy or team or a company in a local market that is out there finding these distressed assets and writing up a scope of work and funding it with maybe like a guy like yourself, you know, they're, they're using hard money, they're using a hard money loan because they need the money, they need the capital to scale. So they're acquiring multiples of these and, and turning them over every month. That's, that's a very, very good business model if you know what you're doing. Uh, but everybody has kind of a different set of guidelines that we're creating a minimum standards. Generally speaking, the roof should be about seven years, has, should have a minimum of seven years or more usable life. Uh, often we find it's more than that, but, uh, but if you had an inspector go by and give you an assessment of the roof, it should be a minimum of seven years. The hot water tank, we're talking about mechanicals here. The hot water tank is so cheap, you know, anywhere from four to 500 bucks, it's usually almost often replaced. The HVAC system is, is a matter of an inspection and using, using some discretion. Ideally, you want something that's going to last 10 years or more. Uh, you'll always need service for, on it. And, and that's generally something that um, you're typically going to have something, a unit that's going to last 10 years or more. And if it's properly maintained and serviced, it will last you a long time. The only other two things that you would consider or we consider mechanicals are the plumbing and the electrical. Uh, most of the properties, in fact, almost all of them, but most of the properties have electrical in them that um, is up to date. It's, it meets code. It's copper. It's not, uh, the, you know, the knob and tube type of uh, electrical from years past. So there's rarely an issue with electrical and electrical is pretty easy to change. And then the plumbing, again, usually it's copper or, or P, uh, PEC. I think it's PEC. Um, it's, it's not the galvanized steel like they used to use long, long, long ago. Uh, if it's in there, they'll replace it. They'll rip it all out and, and replace it. But, um, but generally speaking, 
anything beyond that is co considered cosmetic. We're talking about carpeting, flooring, paint, cabinets, appliances, light fixtures, and all that stuff. Uh, most of that stuff is relatively inexpensive. It's almost always changed out, unless it's in really good condition. If you pick up like a, a property that was built in the 2000s, like a 2005, 2007 property, you're not going to be replacing a lot of this stuff. It's just going to be cleaned and painted and, and just refreshed. So, Yeah, and this is all done before... Uh, an investor would go make that investment. So the operator has found the property, fixed the property up. Is that typically how it works? And then they make the acquisition or are you using the funds from the investor to do the, the rehab and those things? Yeah, well, Ryan, you make two good points. So first of all, as a general rule, yes, that's typically done. Um, well, if, let me rephrase that. It's always done before they close escrow, but it's not necessarily done when they've identified the product, uh, the property and they said, I love that location. I love that property and I love the numbers on it. I realize that you're renovating it right now, but I don't want to lose it. So I want to reserve it or put it under contract subject to the completion of the work, subject to the inspection, subject to the financing, all the standard stuff. So that way they can take it off the market. And the reason I'm saying that is because, because today the velocity of sales is so high because investor demand is, is strong, it's high. Supply is low and it's getting tighter and tighter. And it's not just with investors, it's actually the population as a whole. We're growing as a country, the population is growing, we're not keeping pace in household formations to keep up with population growth and demand. So this is a common problem across the board in virtually every market. But there's nothing wrong with you as an investor coming along and saying, hey, I really like that deal, I want it, but I don't want to lose it to another investor. So let me take it off the market uh, with you and then, um, you know, and then we'll just continue unfolding everything as it normally does. Now, yeah. the other question you mentioned, uh, the financing, very important question. The answer is no, investors do not fund anything up front. They're coming in at the very end of that food chain. They're the last piece of the entire puzzle, if you will. So they're identifying the property at the point where they're saying, oh, I love everything about it. It meets my criteria and, and you know, the inspection is clean. Um, I've gotten the financing, I'm pre-approved. Then they put a down payment on it, then they go into escrow, and then they close on it. They're not financing what you know a hard money lender like yourself would do on a property like that. You're in the middle of that, that, that food chain, if you will. They're on the tail end of it. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And if somebody is funding these deals or wanting to invest, um, can they go to the bank to get a loan? Do they have to pay cash for it? Um, what does that look like if somebody wanted to buy a turnkey rental? They could pay cash for it. We recommend they don't. And in 99% of the situations, they don't. They actually use leverage other people's money. That's the beautiful thing about real estate is you can leverage your investment capital as much as five to one, borrow the lender's, um, uh, borrow the, the lender's capital and let them uh, you know, pay for 80% of the purchase. You pay for 20%. You have 100% of the ownership, 100% of the benefits, 100% of the control. You have 100% of everything. Uh, but you have a lending partner who's in there for 80% of that acquisition. Uh, so leverage is a beautiful thing if done right and it generates income. These are assets that generate positive cash flow. And so it's income, a rate of return. And it's really about leverage at that point. If you've got 20 or 10, let's say you can only get 10 because the spouse doesn't have income or something like that. And you're trying to get that 11th deal. At that point, it's about leverage. And if you can get a 30 year fix at today's rates, even if it's 1% higher, you're going to be in the money. If you got value out of our discussion today, please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. It's a big help to me. Also, please share with a friend. Nothing is more valuable than creating financial friends who are like-minded. You can do that by inviting them to listen to the Income Hacker Podcast. Bye for now and make it a very profitable day.